All right, hello. So welcome to WFI's Reopening Schools. This is a conversation about education and it's part of our ongoing series about education topics that we've been holding here for years at WFYI. Um, and before we get started, I just want to recognize that um, there are many, many questions everyone has um, about the reopening schools during this pandemic. And as a journalist and a parent, I've watched a number of online forums similar to this, and there's always a lot more questions and topics that we can, that are answered. Um, and we get that and we're gonna try and do our best today. Um, but knowing this, WFYI will be having more conversations um, in the coming weeks um, about the reopening of schools and the many different issues um, surrounding that. Um, so to stay informed on future conversations, you can like the WFYI and WFYI News account on Facebook and social media. Um, and that's one way to, to be aware of what we're gonna be doing. So today we have one hour um, until seven o'clock and we're gonna be focused on where we are now um, with the reopening of schools and what um, families and students and teachers can expect on that. Um, and one more thing I just wanna add, um, we will not be take, we will be talking about public health considerations that are at play um, in the opening of schools, but we will not be directly answering any questions about medical advice um, or anything related to that. Okay, so let's get started. We're gonna introduce the panel um, who was here with us this evening and I'm gonna introduce, introduce each one of you. Um, and if you could just say a short bit about yourself and your position and then we'll move on. So first we have um, Jeff Butt, Superintendent of Wayne Township Schools. Good evening, Eric. Thank you so much for uh, having us and for moderating this discussion. It is one that uh, we are all, of course, deeply in, embedded in right now. It uh, is changing daily. I just got off of a phone call with, uh, or actually a meeting with Dr. Kane and several other medical professionals. And so hopefully I can uh, add the latest and greatest to our conversation tonight. Uh, I am Jeff Butts. I'm the superintendent of the Metropolitan School District of Wayne Township. It is in Marion County on the west side of Indianapolis. Okay, great. Next is uh, Juanita Price, a second grade teacher in Indianapolis. Hi, good evening. My name is Juanita Price. I am actually going into my sixth year of teaching, and this is my second year teaching second grade. So I'm just looking forward to getting back to the students and actually in the building with them. All right. Rayanne Ann Winton, um, she's a resource teacher at Seymour Community Schools. Hi, I'm Ryan Witten. I'm a high school resource teacher at Seymour High School. That's, um, for those of you not familiar, that's halfway to Louisville if you're going south on 65. And we are gearing up for back to school in a very fluid situation. All right, and we also have uh, Kristen Weichel, who's a director of the Riley School Program. Hi, I'm Kristen Weichel. I'm uh, the manager of the school program here at Riley Hospital for Children. Um, we are a staff of uh, 12 teachers who provide um, all of the education services to uh, Riley inpatients. And then we also provide services um, to outpatients that are seen in um, our outpatient clinic here at Riley Hospital. So thank you for having me. All right, well again, thanks all for being here tonight. Um, we're gonna try and get to as many topics as possible. And if you're watching, you can um, submit questions in the Facebook box below and we will see what we can get to during um, the evening. So first, I just wanna preface this first question with some, um, some of the data we were crunching today um, at WFII. And um, we were going through um, school reopening plans um, in central Indiana, and we were able to review 50 different plans that are now available. And um, what we found was out of the 50, school districts, um, 41 are gonna be offering an option of full-time or in-person remote instruction. Three districts, three are gonna offer um, a hybrid model um, where students are gonna be in the classroom part-time and then part-time at home. Three districts are gonna have full-time only in-person instruction. Um, and three districts are gonna start with full-time virtual or remote instruction. Um, I think as we know, this is changing daily. Um, so Superintendent Buds, I just kind of wanted you to talk a little bit about what has gone into the, to the decision for how um, Wayne Township Schools is reopening. What are some of the considerations that you have taken into account? Sure, sure. Thank you for that. Um, and that data we know is changing on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, depending on what happens with the data in our, in our own county, in Marion County, uh, our, our plans here may change as well. Uh, we have 
several of the different uh, options that you mentioned just within the Marion County Schools. And so if we go back to March the 12th, when we thought we were going to be closed just until spring break, um, that was uh, something that we were all looking forward to and getting this virus over with and coming back after spring break and finishing out the year strong. And we know that So we're gonna, I think we lost you there for a second. I, I saw everybody lock up. All right. Well, we we uh, you know we know when we finished out the year uh, remotely that not everybody was as prepared as uh, as others were, and so we began planning at the beginning of April on seven different scenarios that might uh, that we might be able to utilize when we came back. And we we're in weekly conversation with the Marion County Public Health Department, and of course following the guidance from the Indiana State Health Department and uh, also the Department of Education. And when uh, several documents came out, we had hoped for a little bit more guidance. We had hoped for more direction, uh, but everything we kept hearing was local decision, uh, use the best information that you have, and um, go from there. And so uh, with the information that we had on June the 24th, which was the, the last meeting we had just prior to the 4th of July weekend with Dr. Kane, uh, we were told it was safe to go ahead and open up. Uh, with our students in person. And then we also were going to offer the virtual model for those who were uncomfortable or unable to return. And uh, today, in fact, we finalized our numbers. 2,600 of our children approximately will be attending the virtual option. That's about 17% of our student population. Uh, we have just talked about the staffing models for that. We're going to need to utilize 60 elementary teachers uh, to accomplish that. Our junior high model will be included uh, with the teachers that are currently teaching junior high, and we have a model for that. And then we do offer a virtual high school so uh, and have for, for a long time, so we'll have the virtual high school option. Uh, the price tag right now, as my in my rough calculations, is about $3.5 million extra uh, above what we had originally budgeted for to offer the, um, the virtual option or the e-learning the e option. Okay. Now, I know you're only um, one district in the state um, and everyone's will look different how they are reopening, but could you explain us a little bit um, of the nitty gritty for your reopening in terms of safety, how you're going to keep buildings clean, how um, if you're able to provide um, personal protection equipment to the staff and students? Yeah, that, that's been, I think, the scariest part and the, and the most difficult part. Um, I heard... Uh, a speaker on a national TV show this morning talked about how schools are built for uh, massive groups of, of individuals. They're built for socialization. They're built to have um, groups working together. And so we're trying to create an environment uh, in our schoolhouses where we're actually separating children. And we're using, uh, through the Marion County Public Health Department, the American Association of Pediatrics guideline of three to six feet. And so we're removing any and all extra furniture out of our classrooms so that we can try to get that three to six feet uh, where we can't. We have purchased 8,000 uh, individual dividers for our children. Uh, we have purchased 60,000 disposable masks, 17,000 cloth masks that we have got from, uh, that we've received from the state, 3,000 of the face shields for our teachers. Uh, we have 5,000 gallons of uh, a product that will sanitize each evening. We have uh, 1,000 buckets, uh, each containing 450 towels with a solution that uh, can be utilized to disinfect in between usages. Um, and we have installed a foamy uh, uh, device, a foamy uh, a, um, hand sanitizer device going into every single classroom and every single building uh, that can be utilized for our students coming and going. So uh, those are some of the kind of high level. We also had to purchase 14,000 devices so that we know that all of our children will have access to the technology when, and I say when because we know this will happen at some point this year where we will all be remote again as we enter the flu season, if not before. And I, so on that topic of that, if this does happen again, if we do return to March and have school buildings were closed um, and we are looking at a fully remote type of learning. Um, Kristen, could you talk a little bit about um, what you think parents students should kind of be planning for right now um, if they could be moving in and out of schools um, due to the conditions of, of the pandemic? Yeah, thank you. Um, so a lot of our children here um, within the hospital setting are, are do that 
right now, right? So they are very fluid and coming back and forth. And so um, some of the things that we work on here with our education team and our medical team and also the family and then the school as well. So it takes an entire, almost like a village, right? To to educate every, every one of our children that are within our facility. So what we, we typically do is having that close communication back with that school. Um, to really truly understand what a child should be doing. Um, we work a lot with classroom teachers, with um, guidance counselors, even with like principals um, to really figure out what is the core programming that that child should be doing while they're in the hospital. We take the direction from that 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 homeschool corporation because they're the ones that are um, implementing the, the curriculum. And so listening together and working together as a team um, is how um, we approach all of our um, education needs here in the hospital. So we'd be talking with the medical directors um, at Riley to understand if a child can go back to school, right, after they're discharged or if they need to continue at home. It's working on sending all of that appropriate paperwork to the school so we can make sure um, our kids um, have all of the boxes checked, so to speak, um, within the education world so our kids can get those services. So I think it can be a very fluid plan. Um, and we highly respect the partnerships that we have with our school districts. Like we can't, we couldn't do this alone. And so, um, you know, those classroom te teachers establishing those um, connections with the kids while they're here in the hospital is so meaningful. Um, and knowing that investment is happening, um, you know, it, it is an amazing kind of cycle of care that we provide and understanding that that approach um, is, is so useful, so yeah. And a lot of the questions we've been getting, um, and I've been just hearing the community, you know, is just wondering about um, the teachers. Um, Juanita, Rayan, you are the two teachers here with us today. Could you just, you know, explain how you're feeling right now, just in terms of preparing to return to the classroom as both of you are planning to do? I'll go first on that one. I personally have, really struggled with this all summer long. I've been teaching, this will be year nine, and I would love nothing more than to go back to school in person the way it has been, you know, all eight of the first day of schools that I've had so far. And this year I've just gone back and forth on whether I feel comfortable or confident about whether or not we can do this safely this year. Um, I want my school to be open for the kids that need it to be open. I want to be there for them, but I worry about this virus and what the other effects would be for if we did go back to school as normal. Juanita. Yeah, so I'm actually looking forward. I really want to be back in the building for the same reasons, but I know that more of my students need it. So just figuring out what it is that we need to do, like I'm going in soon to actually start organizing my desk or tables to make sure that they're spaced out. And I hope that we'll have all of the PPE that we need as well. But I also think that it's important for us to suggest to parents to start practicing wearing masks. I work with lower ed, so some of the students haven't had to wear them over the summer. So like getting them used to wearing the mask, finding the mask that fits their face most comfortably or, you know, just figuring those things out. I think that's a conversation that we need to have with parents to ensure that they're at least doing that part. But I want to go back. I feel like I need to be there. And I, I know, Anita, um, you, in the past, you've enjoyed um, your students working in groups, um, reading circles. Um, right now, how do you think, how do you plan to do that with social distancing, with masks? What are you envisioning uh, when school begins for your classroom? Well, if we can do it as close as three feet, like I'll just have to teach them voice levels. So maybe a little bit higher than a whisper, but not talking too loud so they don't interrupt the other groups. But I plan on still doing as much of it as I can. I know there's some tables where we can sit up to two or three students at the table. So then they'll be able to have that type of interaction. But just really making sure that I teach them how to use the different tools that we have. So like if we have whiteboards, they can use the whiteboards to write to each other or if there's some type of um, platform that we use where they can text each other and we can monitor that. I think that that would be great as well. And Superintendent Butts, um, um, hearing some of the concerns um, from Ryan, I know um, teachers um, in Wayne Township have, have similar concerns. 
how are you talking to them or what kind of reinsurances or other, other kind of options are you offering to educators who are scared to kind of return and be exposed possibly? Well, certainly with the number of teachers that we will need to do the remote learning, there are some opportunities, especially for those who are the most vulnerable of our teachers to uh, be able to be in a setting where they can socially distance, where they can uh, make sure that they're being safe. And, and we are actually, even with our remote learning teachers, what we're calling Wayne at Home, those teachers will be located in a physical building, in a physical classroom or, or a space um, for many reasons. One, we know that the socialization for our teachers is also critically important. And so we're really talking about physically distancing, not socially distancing. I know that's kind of a shift in terminology. Uh, across the country, but we we don't need to socially distance our children. We need to physically distance our children, and so we're really trying to work to change um, that um, those terminologies. But uh, for our teachers, they need the connectivity, and and some of our teachers live in areas where they they really struggle to have that connectivity. They struggle to have the resources that that they would have in their classroom, and and so. Uh, their ability to teach synchronously and asynchronously is going to be greatly enhanced by uh, having them in the classroom and being able to be still engaged with other grade level team members uh, or content level team members, but just doing so from a distance. And one of the things I think that we've learned most recently is we really need to promote for uh, our adults and for our children to stay six feet uh, apart from each other as often as they possibly can and definitely not for any longer than, than 15 minutes. That's, that's where we start to get into the contact tracing is that closer than six feet for 15 minutes or longer. And so we, we all need to become cognizant of the time that we're spending together and the distance that we have from each other uh, as we, we work through this. So we are hoping to be able to provide as much PPE as we possibly can. Uh, we had a committee this past uh, several months that also talked about uh, how to support mental health for not only our students, but also for our adults and for our community, uh, because we know that that's a significant factor for uh, especially those that have been uh, in, in isolation or those who have, have truly tried to, uh, to do their best to, to flatten the curve. Um, but we also know that we have uh, members of our staff and, uh, and other adults, we all can, can cite plenty of examples where there are uh, individuals who are out there not practicing good um, responsible practices to make sure that we're not spreading this virus. Um, going to the fair without masks on and going to Fourth of July parties and not socially distancing. And, you know, we all can can look through our, our social media feeds and see plenty of those examples. And so I think one of the uh, one of the messages that I will be sharing in, our, in my opening day message to to our to our staff is it's all of our responsibility to make sure that we are practicing those practices that we know uh, are those safe practices that are gonna keep us from getting the virus, but most importantly, keep others from getting the virus. And so uh, I told a group that I spoke to just the other day, I wear my mask to protect them. I appreciate them wearing their mask to protect me because I'm trying to protect my wife and, and her ability to go visit her family. So, you know, there's lots of other factors here as well, but uh, I think, each one of us taking our own personal responsibility to make sure we are doing what we are supposed to do will also protect our colleagues. And one of those ways of doing that is wearing, wearing a mask. And I know some schools are mandating that for all grades, some schools, it's only certain grades. Um, and I know for, for my own daughter who will be in school, um, she doesn't wear a mask very often right now. Um, it's pretty rare um, when she's actually out in a public place where she needs a mask. So um, Kristen, for, for families and students who aren't used to wearing masks, what would you suggest they do to kind of prepare for returning to school and getting used to wearing them in their face? Yeah, so um, just a funny, like super cute story that a lot of our Riley patients wear masks all the time anyway, right? Prior to any um, COVID or any need for that in the community. So um, some of our patients have and sharing that they feel normal now, right? Because um, when they are in the community or when they would be going back to school, their their peers and their friends would be wearing that. Um, and so it is kind of um, just a different way of thinking about some of our more vulnerable populations who were required to wear that prior to any of this, right? And so um, within 
our hospital, though, in terms of making things a little bit more normal, we have an amazing um, creative arts therapy team um, with like child life, with um, art therapy, music therapy, dance movement therapy. And so what we have been doing here is trying to make it normal, right? So kids definitely, um, when you talk about it more, when you bring it up in some different activities, um, it normalizes the, the thought process. And so depending on the different grade levels, for example, some of our therapists have created um, how kids can decorate their own masks, right? And one of the ideas we shared um, is we have a coloring page and, and the kids can decorate it. And then the teacher can create like a bulletin board or a space where um, those masks can be displayed. You can incorporate things through music. You can make a classroom song. Um, you know, for the older students, um, definitely um, we acknowledge, right? Like, oh gosh, this, this might not be normal to you right now. Let's acknowledge the elephant in the room, right? And so, and then you can move on. But here's why. Here's why we need to be doing this. Um, we can do some journaling. We can do some different thought processes. So we have, um, our team has shared a lot of those resources with the Indiana Department of Education, and we can most certainly share that with this group as well, um, um, because there are different different modes and different opportunities to, to incorporate things and make things a little bit more normal. Some of the, I've, I've seen a few questions come in um, that ask about, you know, the policies on mask wearing you know, will this become a discipline issue? Do you think students could be forced to wear a mask? Um, for the educators, um, some kind of butts, um, the teachers, have you gotten to this point yet? Are you thinking about these issues that could arise? That was one of the first discussions we had, ironically, um, is what about those students that don't wear them? Uh, and so, much like any other uh, rule or guideline in our handbooks, we will have a progressive discussion. Uh, we've said we're not going to suspend students for not wearing masks. We're not going to, to have detentions and in-school suspensions for students who are not wearing masks. But we will continue to have progressive discussions, beginning with the student and then their parent, and uh, you know, working through a process um, because eventually it becomes a safety issue. And when we look at it as a safety issue, just like any other safety issue that we have, when it becomes unsafe because of a chosen behavior, we will look at another option. And fortunately in Wayne, we do have that other option and it's called Wayne at Home. Uh, it, is, it is the virtual school in which the students will go through the same uh, curriculum with the same scope and, and pacing of, of what is happening in the in-person um, classroom, uh, but that'll be a personal choice. And so uh, we'll have plenty of discussions before we get to that point, but it will be, will be progressive in that way. Um, and, and again, eventually leading to a safety concern because they are choosing not to wear that mask and keep others safe. I would like to add a little bit to that as well. In my school district, masks are only strongly recommended for staff and students. So there's not a requirement at any point in the day where they will have to wear a mask. However, this is what we would call a teachable moment. I need to teach my students why this is important. I need to teach empathy and being a good neighbor and caring for each other. Because I think when I say, hey, if you wear this mask, you protect me. And then I don't get sick and I don't have to have a sub come in for me. There's nothing my students hate more than when I'm not there. So, Having those conversations and working through that is going to be very important. I'd say, Randy, it, even worse for 10 to 14 days, right? To have a sub come in for 10 to 14 days because they didn't wear their mask. Yeah. And on, on, um, on the same topic, we just had um, a question submitted that, and I think um, Superintendent Butts, you, you kind of um, alluded to this, but will there be any guidance you know, for teachers and students um, for their behaviors outside of school? You kind of mentioned, you know, just being responsible and wearing a mask. Um, you can't, I'm guessing those can't be enforced, but I would imagine they're going to be strongly uh, recommended um, from different administrations at different schools. They are. And, you know, it, it, it's been interesting it, is if, as you've watched Marion County have a mandatory mask guideline um, and that being a health department enforceable infraction. So that it's not a violation of law. It's something that the health department, and we're supposed to take a picture of that individual and send it to the health department, and then they're going to follow. Well, we know that that's not going to happen. So it really, it, it uh, I think to Ray Ann's point, it becomes incumbent upon all of us to talk about the responsibility and to talk about the, uh, the, the, the true impact that wearing a mask can have on all of our health. And, um, you know, I've started to see some additional 
uh, postings out uh, and about in, in social media talking about how we would be back to having some more level of normalcy today if we would have eight, you know, 10 weeks ago done what we were supposed to do and what we knew to be uh, helpful. And and so it really comes down to, and, and I get, I understand the, the discussions on both sides and, and I'm not here to talk about violation of people's rights and uh, that everybody has their own, their own thought on that. But um, we do know that if we are, are doing what we're supposed to be doing, wearing masks and socially distancing, uh, we can get back to that level of normalcy that everybody wants at much, much quicker pace. Um, on, a, on a totally different topic, um, social emotional learning um, has been a huge concern um, since March when, this, when school bus closed down. Um, so Anita, when, you, when your students come in, um, what kind of, I guess, support are you gonna be giving to them right away, kind of just understanding that they haven't been in front of their teacher, you know, for many months now? Well, reestablishing norms, extending grace, making sure that we come together and talk about those, um, we call them classroom agreements, that they understand why we have to do things a little bit differently, because with them being in second grade, they've been in school before, but I also think about the kindergartners that have never been in school. So like, we're now establishing being in this new place and doing something that you've never had to do. So just explaining to them, over explaining to them why it's important and just talking about how we'll work through it together because I'll have to get used to sitting in a mask for a whole day as well. So just having those conversations. And Ryan, when you see some of the students that you've had in past years, what's your plan for kind of trying to reconnect with them and just see how, how they're doing? Well, not just in the going back to school, but in just the world, so much has happened. I have the very unique opportunity to work with teenagers and I get to work with them, with them from grade nine to grade 12. So by the time they're juniors or seniors, I've known these kids for a long time and you know, there's a very good rapport there. And we're gonna have a lot to talk about, not just with COVID, but with the world, the protests, everything that's been happening, you know, there's an election coming up and some of my kids are gonna go vote for the first time in November. So we have a lot to get caught up on and we have a lot to just talk through and say, hey, let's, let's learn about this together and let's be there for each other from six feet apart. <laughs> and for the students um, who will not return to school, um, be remotely learning, um, Kristen, what would you, I guess, suggest to, their, to them, to their families, their teachers to kind of help um, what they can do to keep that social emotional bond there? Mm -hmm. Right. The yeah. So um, it's really cute here in the hospital when, you know, we'll get a, a patient and we'll, we'll get their assignments from their, their school. And depending on, especially the younger kids, um, it is adorable when we say, you know what, your teacher wants you to do this and you should see their eyes like brighten. They're like, are you really like, they want me to do this work. And so um, we know that our kids are so invested um, in establishing those connections and the teachers do such an amazing job of making sure every child matters to them. It is a beautiful thing to see here in the hospital. Um, and we, we use our classroom teachers a lot, right? <laughs> to get our kids a little bit more motivated to do some of the work. And so, um, you know, the things that we do here in the hospital is we do a lot of FaceTime. We do a lot of video conferencing. We do a lot of con like real connections back into that classroom. We do note writing. Um, you know, even having that one teacher send a kid in the hospital a note, it just brightens their whole spirit. So uh, continuing that, those real connections that teachers already know and how to do and to make is, is amazing to see. Um, and um, those would be the things, definitely um, having those opportunities to have the one-on-one -on -one conversations with kids who might not be in that classroom um, is so beneficial. And for, you know, for the families who do have health concerns about returning back to school, what would you say, uh, um, you know, or for Kristen, um, yeah. What is the process that they should go through um, with their family doctor or mm -hmm. someone else to kind of decide if it's right for them, safe for them to return to school? Right. That's, that's a great question. Um, so the first thing we would recommend doing is, again, having that conversation with your primary care, um, either your physician or if you are seen here in Riley, having that a conversation with your specialist. Um, they're going to be able to know um, what that individual's um, 
progression looks like within their, their chronic illness or their disease, um, and if it would be um, in their, their best interest of the child to return back to school. So um, that would be the first step is to have that conversation. And then um, after that, then it, once you get that information, um, having that conversation with your school, making sure you can reach out to your guidance counselor, your um, if your child receives some education help, whoever is that person, that point person established at the school, so you can make a plan together. Um, it's all about that communication. It's all about um, what is in that one child's best interest and in, in establishing a, a great plan for them. Okay, great. So we're about three. We're about at the halfway mark right now. I'm going to bring in some questions that we're getting um, online. Um, and that were submitted earlier um, from different viewers and, and listeners. Um, and I, I mean, I think, you know, one question that we're seeing is just like, and Superintendent Butts, possibly you could take this, is just what is the driving factor for opening up schools when there is the, you know, the belief for, for many that we will all be remote learning again? Is there a certain reason schools are pushing to reopen? <laughs> There are a number of them, uh, especially when you have uh, a population of students that are greatly at risk. Uh, we know that even though hundreds of thousands of cases of child abuse uh, have gone unreported, um, we know that's not because it's not happening. Uh, we know that child abuse reports uh, are, are not happening because our, our students are not in the, in the schoolhouse. Uh, we know that uh, for many of our students, the socialization aspect, which is why the the pediatricians, uh, not only in the state of Indiana uh, and also across the country, uh, know that that's a very important aspect of our students being together. Uh, there is no greater place to learn. There's no greater environment to learn than in the classroom with the teacher. And uh, we know that uh, we can do our very best to try to help students to learn online, but certainly uh, in the schoolhouse with a, that relationship that is being built with that caring adult, the teacher, uh, is the best place for our students to learn. Uh, we would also tell you that as we look at going remotely, uh, we'll be doing a lot of blended learning inside of our classrooms. We'll be preparing our students for going to that remote option. When we had one day to prepare, um, there were certain, certain things that we had not prepared them well to do on their own with their device. And so uh, in doing that in the classroom over the next as many weeks as we have, we know that our students will be much better prepared, uh, which will allow our teachers to have much greater access and to, to have a greater level of rigor in their course, uh, in their, their lessons, because the students are prepared to be able to log into systems, to be able to get to certain software programs, uh, to be able to utilize the tools that are available to them on their device. And here's kind of a follow-up from a, someone else that sent, um, in regards to virtual learning, since I know Wayne Township has offered that for many years, um, what kind of metrics or what should a parent be looking for to, to know that the virtual learning, remote learning they're receiving from their school district is of high quality? Well, I'd say the simple answer is it should have the same level of rigor that uh, the child would experience in, a, in an in-person classroom. Uh, and it shouldn't be uh, just the one or two hours that we were expecting when we, when we had to shut down and, and did not have uh, as much in place as we do today. Uh, they should expect that there's engagement with the teacher for multiple hours a day and that there's asynchronous learning that goes on for, for multiple hours as well. It, it shouldn't be, uh, you know, in, in many cases, uh, it should be five to six hours a day. Uh, the challenge that, uh, and I will tell you, this is another reason for us to at least have the option for our students to come back. Uh, and, and one that I'm hearing in, in many other conversations as well, uh, many of our children are home alone. Uh, their families have to work and their parents have to be at their place of employment. And so that creates an additional challenge when you're talking about a remote learning situation when they do not have that support network at home to provide that reinforcement that a teacher or a teacher and other adults in the classroom would be able to provide. So uh, I think there will be some situations, I know there will be some situations where we have students who are learning from home uh, who will, will have a great deal of, of trouble being successful because that support network isn't there to, to make sure that they uh, have the resources necessary, that they have the the um, that they're paying attention to the to the um, to the schedule and to the teachers and and making sure that they're fully engaged. Okay. We received a question from um, an educator, a teacher, um, who said last earlier this year um, when COVID um, the pandemic started, this teacher had a student um, whose father passed away um, from the coronavirus and it ravaged the family's emotion uh, emotionally and financially. 
Um, and their question is, how do teachers, educators, the administration, how do they respond to families who are directly impacted? Kristen, are you able to kind of weigh in on this? I mean, what, what role should yeah. a teacher have or how should they kind of support a family who does face? Mm -hmm. Right, and so, yeah, um, that is such a hard thing to, to do, right? And so um, what we recommend here at Riley is the first thing to do is obviously have that conversation with that family that was impacted by a loss um, and to see what exactly um, the family would like to be shared and what information um, is being, they feel comfortable um, being shared throughout the school or, or whatnot. And so um, that would be our first recommendation. And then the, the second would be um, to work in conjunction with whatever, if it's like a crisis prevention team, if it's the school guidance counselor, if it's um, maybe sometimes a social worker on staff at the school, whoever has that special training to really truly understand what grieving looks like for children and how to process that. Um, you know, we send information to schools to help with that, um, but definitely, you know, it takes that effort within that building um, for that that one person or the designated team to understand um, the complexities with that. It, it's a really hard thing to, to do and, you know, lots, all of our schools that we've worked with um, have done such an amazing job in, in discussing this topic. It is a hard one. Okay. Um, Eric, I just, if, if I could, I, I would just piggyback off of that. I think it's important too for our publics to know that we deal with childhood trauma all the time. Uh, our children bring ACEs to, to school um, that we have to, to be able to work through. And so um, while this pandemic is creating other other opportunities for different trauma. Um, we have, we see trauma all the time. And so we've unfortunately become very well adept at mobilizing teams of individuals together uh, to not only support the student in the classroom and their friends and others that are related to them, but also to their families uh, and, you know, reaching out of the community. So uh, we'll, we'll engage in those same practices that we have, have engaged in over the years. Um, it just is a different circumstance. Okay. Um, and here's um, a question from a subscriber to our Indiana 2020 uh, two-way tech service, um, which is available if you're interested in giving us feedback. Um, and um, this question, I'm not really sure anyone here can you know, address it um, statewide, but it's regarding um, whether school staff and children will be tested for COVID um, prior to school starting or if temperatures will be taken um, each morning before they enter the building. Um, I can say, and I've been when I was reading through some of the 50 or so reopening plans um, in central Indiana, there were a few schools that were going to be doing um, some testing on site. Um, but I'd open that up um, to anyone here that can respond if they've heard of that or if, if Wayne will be doing any kind of testing prior to school starting. I'll be happy to, to jump in. We, we are not requiring testing um, prior to. The reality is um, there isn't free testing out there available for those who are uh, asymptomatic, have not had close contact. Even those that are symptomatic that have not had close contact, there is not necessarily readily available testing. Uh, so for us to test our 17,000 children and 2,500 employees prior to coming back is, is just not a reality. So we are asking people to self-screen. Um, not only those students and staff that will be coming into the building, but any visitor that comes into the building has to complete a self-screener before they come in. Um, and again, we're, we're looking on some uh, level of honesty when it comes to that uh, so that we can, can all be safe. And uh, we're looking for primarily that 100.4 degree temperature um, without medication, and then uh, two or three of the other factors that uh, might also exist that would exempt somebody from coming to school, coming to work, uh, or entering the building. Uh, with regard to um, temperature uh, monitoring, there are a lot of um, problems with doing that, especially if a student has just run in from the school bus, if they've been in a, a warm situation for a period of time, um, you could get a higher reading than, than what uh, is actual for the student. In addition, uh, if you, the same reason that we don't do things like metal detectors at every door, uh, we would have a large group of students who would be standing outside for a significant period of time, um, probably not socially distancing as we're trying to take their temperature and get them into the building. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that being said, we'll, we will have, we do have um, thermometers in every one of our nurses' offices. We'll have one in the main office. 
Uh, and then we'll have a third in the building um, that'll be a designated location from the administration so that we do have uh, temperature uh, thermometers or reading devices that we can make sure if a student does appear to have a fever or appear to have an elevated temperature, uh, we can take care of that very quickly. And one of the guidances or one of the, the guidelines that we've been given is to have a separate area for those students who are symptomatic. And so we've designated in each one of our buildings an area where we could actually place students who are symptomatic as we're waiting for their parents to come pick them up. Okay. Um, and Superintendent Butts, I guess we'll, th this question will also go back to you. Um, we got a few questions just about riding the bus in general. Um, um, I know, I think in Marion County, a lot of school districts are looking at having one student per seat. Um, can you give, I guess, can you give any information on, on how students will be riding the bus in Wayne Township? So this has been one of our greatest struggles. When we started talking about the social distancing, um, I think we calculated 13 students per bus is what we could get on our school buses. And um, we know that we do not have the resources to be able to get our students into school if, if we were to operate with that six foot social distancing. However, or I should say physical distancing, I need to take my own advice, physical distancing. Um, what we are going to be doing, and this is going to be important no matter the situ what situation the child is in, if they're on the school bus, in the classroom, in the cafeteria, is we're going to have seating charts for every single location that those individuals go uh, go to so that we do know who was sitting by them and who was within that six feet for more than 15 minutes. We're gonna sit siblings together as much as possible, which we've joked that our fifth and sixth grade students are gonna be so bummed out if they have a kindergarten sibling because they've been waiting their whole entire elementary career to sit in the back of the bus. And if they have a kindergarten sibling, they're gonna be sitting up front. Um, so. And of course, all facing forward, drivers will have masks. Uh, we will not have additional partitions in the school buses because the state police have been very clear. A modification of the inside of the bus um, will not certify the bus to be uh, able to be to transport children. So we will not be making any modifications to the inside of the buses uh, from the direction of our, our state police department. I would also tell you that um, another interesting fact, and we're, we're working on this in our classrooms, especially at the secondary level where students change classes just by having the same schematic seating chart in each classroom by alphabet will reduce a student's contacts by up to 24 percent and so we that's really what we're trying to accomplish is if we can have fewer contacts and keep our cohorts together more often then we'll have a greater chance of um, reducing the amount of of contact tracing that will need to be done should a case um, be made of, uh, you know, should a case be positive. Okay. A lot of the feedback we've gotten is really, you know, focused around the educators, um, how, you, how you're feeling. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, anyone who is reading the news right now, um, following current events, you know, there is a great pressure on schools, you know, to reopen um, in person. You know, President Trump has demanded schools reopen in person, Indiana congressman, filed a bill to try and block federal funds from schools. Um, I think yesterday, some teachers in Florida, teachers union there filed a lawsuit against the governor for trying to force schools to reopen for five days. Um, so um, Juanita and Ryan, I was wondering, you know, there's a lot of pressure that's on, you know, you, even though it's out of your control um, to be in school teaching. Um, do you feel that stress? Do you and your other, um, educators that you know, are you do you feel under stress by just what is being pushed down on you to make sure the building's open? I don't think I feel the stress because I don't have a family to come home to. Like it's just me that I have to worry about. So if I can do what I need to do and be there for my students, like I'm okay. I don't have to come home and worry about children or a spouse or my parents. So that's probably why I'm not feeling it, but I understand. Mm -hmm. Rayanne, how about you? On a personal level, I'm kind of with Juanita here. Like, I don't feel the stress. I am a low risk individual. I'm not caring for elderly parents. I'm not concerned about who I'm going to spread the virus to in my immediate family. Mm -hmm. However, we need to open schools safely. And the HEROES Act has just been waiting to be passed. And that's a bill that would provide funding for PPE. If we're gonna be able to social distance the way we really need to be, we're gonna need a lot of PPE, we're gonna need a lot of sanitizer, we're gonna need 
staffing to be able to supervise students over a larger area of the school. So if we're gonna open up, we need to have the resources to open up safely. And blocking funding is not gonna be what helps us to open up safely. And that was um, the, my next question um, for Superintendent Butts is um, um, this afternoon in South Carolina, Vice President Mike Pence was there and he said that, um, that the next coronavirus relief package will contain a lot of education funding. Um, if you were able to speak with him, what would you say, I guess, schools need in terms of that funding? What would it be used for? We're hearing the same thing, uh, that the, the next stimulus package probably will be directed more directly to schools and not necessarily to state governments to, to distribute. Um, we hope is a terrible strategy, but I will tell you, uh, as we've looked at our additional purchases for PPE technology, additional staffing that we put into place, uh, we've done so because we know we need to be responsive today to what we are currently facing with the hope that the um, funding will come forward for us to be able to, to sustain those things and to not have a negative impact in future years for what we're looking at uh, as, as uh, we, we feel the impact of these additional expenditures that we're having to, to put into place. And I've shared with, with many of my colleagues have, this will be the most expensive school year that any of us have ever seen uh, so that we can try to do our very best to keep our students and our staff safe uh, as we are working to get them back into school and, and to educate them. So uh, for Vice President Pence, uh, absolutely. I think these dollars need to go to uh, our people. They need to go to our teachers, to our, uh, our, our custodians and maintenance folks that are doing the additional cleaning, uh, to our, our transportation employees who are getting our students to and from school. Uh, the more that we can have those individuals in place, the greater opportunity to Rayanne's point, we have to get our students further apart, to socially distance, uh, to make sure that we're able to provide an in-person experience that is safe for them to return. One of the questions we received was about um, ch um, children with special needs and this is asking what guidance is being offered to, to, to parents with children with special needs um, in elementary and high school. Um, are, those are they being told to make um, the decision to return to school in a different way? Can anyone respond to that? Great. Um, so I know when the Indiana Department of Education released their in-class document um, in early June, there was lots of information regarding um, children with special needs and even including children with um, who are considered the vulnerable population and what um, can be done and, and should be done to kind of help facilitate that. Um, you know, and I think... Um, I think just having those conversations with whoever it's that designated person at the school, if that's the child special education teacher, if that's the special education director, if that is maybe the, the principal even, um, about the concerns. So that way it can be kind of discussed in an open forum. Um, and, um, you know, definitely checking back in with that that child's um, physician too, right? And so we wanna make sure um, that all of those boxes are kind of checked, so to speak, before um, we, we kind of start the school year or even as school year is starting. Um, yeah, just maintaining that open communication. I'd like to kind of piggyback on that. I am a special education teacher and it's definitely going to be a case by case basis. There's not one correct answer on whether or not students with individualized education plans should return to school in the fall. There's a lot to consider. Um, either way, I am confident schools will be providing special education services, whether that student is virtual or in person. But if let's say a student has an underlying health condition that makes them vulnerable, that's a conversation you need to have with the physician and make a decision that works for your family. But if you have a student that maybe is relatively healthy and needs a lot of one-on-one -on -one support, I think sending them to school would be a good option, but that's a decision that families need to make and not one person. Eric, I'll, I'll throw out as well, and, and Kristen, I'm sure could speak to this too. The more, I think one of the most challenging um, things that we heard were our inability to utilize a nebulizer. Uh, we have students that are asthmatics that are, I mean, the as, if you're in the nurse's office, the nebulizer is running almost nonstop all day long uh, for students who have breathing problems. And we are not able to use that because of the aerosol. 
Um, we have a, a significant number of our students who have tracheotomies that um, need those those cleaned, and we're not able to do that again because of the aerosol. There's a number of situations. So to Rayanne's point, there are different levels of uh, of needs for our children, and some of those, especially the physical needs, because of our our limitations, are going to mean that we are not able to service them at the schoolhouse or in working with their doctor, for instance, an asthmatic, maybe there is an inhaler that they could utilize to get them through the day as opposed to a nebulizer. Um, but there are some conditions that we just aren't going to be able to account for in the school. And so we're going to have to be very creative through the case conference process and working with the, the, the special education department and the home and, and figuring out how we provide these services to our children so that we can keep them on track. I 100% agree, Dr. Butts. Thank you for addressing that. I know we've been getting lots of calls about nebulizers and seeing if there's a way we can switch some of our children over, if it's safe to do that, to a different type of treatment. Um, and I know a lot of the, the the calls, I think, also depends on, you know, like exactly what you said. Is that in the child's best interest? And is it a, is it, um, a case conference decision to decide what kind of curriculum would be the best for the child? Um, and, and it is, I you know, it is a hard decision to make for anybody. And, um, you know, just being really respectful of everyone's decisions and, and how to move forward is the key. And um, I've been doing some reporting on that topic, on these topics as well. And so if we go to WFI's website, we have uh, some stories regarding um, special education and um, advice from different people there. And the Department of Education has, has been ongoingly providing a huge document online as well with all kinds of um, guidance um, on how families and teachers can respond to and their needs on there too. I'd recommend that to look at. Um, getting close to seven o'clock, but I wanna try and get through a, a few more questions um, that, that we have. Um, and you know, one issue that I, I've seen pop up a few times here, I've heard people talking about is the role of the nurses um, inside schools and how some schools do not even have a, a nurse um, in, in the building. Um, Superintendent Butts, I'm not sure if you're the best person out of this panel to answer that, but can you talk a little bit about how the role of nurses is currently for when schools re reopen? Well, we're we're one of the, I, I've been in those situations where I've had a nurse two and a half days of the week, um, and then my secretary was the one, either my secretary or myself were the one that was dispensing medicine in the middle of the day during lunch. Um, a terrible situation. And uh, I'm very fortunate in the MSD of Wayne Township, we do have a nurse in every one of our buildings, a registered nurse, in fact, uh, which has been very important to our Board of Education. In addition, we work very closely with IU Health, and so we have a doctor on call that we are able to, uh, to for our nurses to work with when we have situations pop up. Uh, in the short term, we are actually hiring a, an additional nurse to be in our, our building so that our lead nurse can go and, and work with the other nurse uh, if a situation were to pop up in a specific building. And that way we do have a very centralized uh, point of contact. We have a consistent message and a consistent procedure that's going to be taken care of because our lead nurse will be able to go out into that building. And so, but there are districts across the state, I've worked in them, uh, where this, the, the, the availability of a nurse in every building does not exist. And uh, it's really, that, that is a significant challenge when uh, you're looking for some medical, you know, professional medical advice from somebody who's trained. Uh, when you have things that that pop up on those other two and a half days that the nurse isn't in your building. And Kristen, when you've spoken with families um, that you've worked with who returned to school, um, is that a consideration that you discuss with them whether there is a nurse or not, and and what they should do if there great. is not? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, so. The, I would say almost all of our children have health plans um, and those health plans are written like in conjunction with like the physician as well as the school nurse or the school like the liaison for the district, the nurse liaison. Um, and so we definitely address all of those concerns and those needs and who is going to be the primary, maybe who's going to be the secondary backup, who, what would happen if that nurse is sick for the day, um, who can kind of take charge of, of that patient or that student's care and who is familiar with that, right? So I know those are lots of things that we process through. Um, we, we definitely rely a lot on our school nurses. They, they, they help out amazing. They're amazing. And so um, I think having those conversations with um, a district, if you had concerns, if you didn't have a nurse in the building um, and what, who can, be that point of care for that child. 
a lot of the questions that we're getting, you know, I think people really want like concrete answers. And I know we're really unable to give concrete answers due to every school district and every some schools being very, very different um, based on their plans, um, their leadership, the school boards making decisions. Um, but a question that we are getting is, you know, what will happen if a student in a school tests positive? Um, I know there are different kinds um, of con uh, contact tracing plans schools are, are putting in place. Um, Superintendent Butts, can, is there a plan um, for what at your schools if a student in a school is positive? There is, however, if I could, I, I'd be interested to know if Winita or Rayan have been, if their districts have shared yet what that looks like for them as a teacher, if a student shows up symptomatic in, in your classroom. Have, have you gotten that far yet on, on what the procedures are in your classrooms? If they show up and they're symptomatic? Yes. If they show up and they are symptomatic, our, per our district plan, they are to go to the nurse, be evaluated and very likely sent home. That's, yeah. that's a pretty that's a simple, straightforward answer. Yeah, so you know, it's interesting, Eric, every school district is supposed to be working with their local county health department. Mm -hmm. um, in, in our district, um, or in, in Marion County, Dr. Kane has uh, informed us to what our procedures are, and that's to work directly with Mount Marion County Health Department to do that contact tracing. Uh, they are uh, very proud of, of the work that they are doing. And so when that, uh, when that does occur, we are to engage Marion County Public Health Department immediately. There is a great resource on the Indiana, and probably the best one that we've we've come across. The Indiana State Department of Health um, has a great parent screener tool. It also has a great chart to look at for um, what the result is for those that have tested positive that are symptomatic or asymptomatic, those that have had no tests that have other explanations as to why they may have that sniffle or that sore throat. Um, and so there's there's some great guidelines there, uh, but every situation is going to be unique, uh, and those are you know, kind of broad guidelines. Um, you know, the question is asked of us, will the whole classroom be quarantined? Will will the whole school be shut down? Will, you know, when can kids come back? And, and again, that's why making sure that we have seating charts and we know where every child is and who is around them becomes critically important because we're right now, we're looking at that six foot for 15 minutes or longer as that um, direct contact. And so the other question we get a lot is, what about siblings? Well, a contact of a contact is not somebody that we need to worry about. It's direct contact with a symptomatic uh, individual who uh, has tested positive or, or a symptomatic individual who is not, depending on what level of quarantining will need to occur. Um, but chasing this and tracking this is going to be uh, critically important, which again is why our nurses are so important in this process, so that we know we have a running chart uh, as to when a certain student was put onto quarantine and when they're able to come back. Uh, and then how we're going to educate those children for those 10 to 14 days, depending on the circumstance while they're away, they won't go into our Wayne at home program. They will stay with their, with their teacher that they've been working with, uh, but they will have to do so in a remote manner. So there are a lot of unknowns. And I know that's a, a big fear of parents is, you know, what about my child that frequently gets fevers. It's not because of, it's because of another condition. It's not because of COVID, but they get fevers a lot. Well, at this point, 72 hours fever free. Uh, and that's, it, there's no asterisk on that. It's 72 hours fever free if you get a fever, regardless of the circumstance. So much of what we're talking about, I mean, it's, it's very serious. Um, people are very nervous. Um, so Anita, I'm wondering, I mean, what are you hoping to do to kind of bring fun into the classroom when school starts? I mean, you know, being at recess, being at lunch, you know, traditionally and other activities are fun at school um, without wearing a face mask and these things. What are you hoping to do to kind of bring that back into your classroom despite all this going on right now? Well, that's exactly it. Like I said, as long as we can be outside, we're going outside for as much as we can. I guess I'll have to um, talk to my principal about it. But if we can have class outside sometimes, if we can eat lunch outside sometimes, I love being outside. So as long as we can do it, that's my plan. And Ryan, what are you hoping that you can do to kind of bring back, I guess, you know, the old way of things were in, into the classroom, that kind of feeling for students and teachers? One of my little quirky things, I guess, is kind of unique to me in my building is that I use scenes from the office to teach social skills lessons. 
And I'm looking for the just right scene from the office to show my students when we get back. Um, actually, of all the things for this to happen, um, the very last day I was in school, I had a pretzel day themed party for um, my class before we went on spring break. And if you're familiar with the office, um, Michael and Stanley wait in line all day to get a soft pretzel <laughs> instead of working. So it was the last day before spring break and I brought my kids soft pretzels. Now, probably cannot take soft pretzels and hand them out to students right now, but I'm gonna find some way for us to get back together and laugh with face masks on. Okay. And Kristen, um, what advice would you, I guess, give to educators like, um, to try and do this? Since I know that some of the patients, students that you work with, you know, have a lot on their minds in terms of their condition uh, and what they're dealing with. How do you kind of help them just yeah. feel that that's not an issue? Yeah, that's a great point. I know establishing that school community, like that classroom community, right? Having a morning meeting, addressing um, the thoughts and feelings. Um, you know, children are so attuned to people's emotions and people's affects that, um, you know, we always encourage addressing it and giving them the information um, that is current and the most up to date, right? And so um, having... I guess making sure your your bond, which our our, class, our teachers do anyway. So like having that time where kids can process their feelings and feel safe to do that um, is very is very key, right? And then, and then incorporating the fun, like both Juanita and Rayanne said as well, like um, having those opportunities where kids can be kids, right? And um, depending, and that can be K through twelve. Um, so yeah, bringing and I and I think so many people have such wonderful ideas out there to do that. Well, it's seven o'clock, so we're going to wrap this up. Again, I want to thank the panel, um, all four of you, so much for being here. Um, and like I said at the start, um, it's almost impossible to get to all the questions and topics, and I'm sure we could spend an hour discussing everything that we missed um, and didn't even talk about. Um, WFY will be having more um, of these conversations in the future, and they will probably be more focused on one topic so we can really dig into different areas um, that, that we'll all be facing when schools uh, reopen. I would like to give each of you just um, let you make one more comment if you like, to just kind of what you think maybe parents, students, teachers should kind of keep in their minds um, as we move forward um, to the start date of schools. And uh, Kristen, you wanna go first? Um, I know that um, just being, giving everyone some grace, being very compassionate. This, these are some hard decisions being made for everyone. Um, you know, for my own district, right, we can choose two different options. And so, um, you know, what might work really well for my family might not work really well for someone else. So just giving people um, that grace to know that it's okay. And, um, you know, like I, we always say here at IU Health, we're all in this together, right? And so we are, and, um, and to know that everyone's kind of having those same emotions. Thanks. And Rayanne? I do not envy anyone that's having to make these nearly impossible decisions on whether or not to send their child to school or whether or not to go to work themselves. So I would just say, kind of be back on what Kristen was saying, give yourself grace and give the people around you grace too. And know that your school community wants you to make a decision that works for you and wants it to be as safe as it possibly can be with the resources that we have. Juanita? What would you like to say? To yeah, I forgot to add. Families, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to add earlier. I love to dance and I typically dance a lot in my classroom. So that'll be a perfect way to like have brain breaks too if the students just stand up right, be right behind their desk. But um, yeah, I think we're all saying the same thing. Flexibility, grace, knowing that things are changing, but we're all doing the best that we can. And yeah, just ask the questions that need to be asked and then give the grace for us to figure it out together. Superintendent Butts. Um. We've talked a lot about choice, uh, a lot about our parents having the opportunity to make a choice on whether to send their teachers or send their students back 
or to go remote, uh, we're not giving our teachers a choice. Uh, we're telling our teachers they have to come in. And so I think it's important that we all realize that our teachers are working harder than they've ever worked before. Uh, they're in teaching in spaces that they have, have, were not necessarily professionally trained to teach. And we're working to, to provide those supports to, to provide that professional development. Um, but our teachers are the frontline workers now. Our teachers are the, are the heroes. And they're the ones that uh, are doing everything they possibly can to make sure that our children have the resources, the services, the education, all of the, the, the things that we provide inside of the classroom and inside of the schoolhouse. And so um, I appreciate, the, as, as was mentioned, the grace that our, our communities are giving to our teachers. Um, and uh, we just need to continue to support them and everything that they're doing and all the uncertainties that they're facing as they come back and throughout the year as we move back and forth between uh, an in-person and, and a virtual model, uh, because this is as challenging on our teachers as any uh, employee group or any, any group that uh, is involved with the school. So I just wanna thank Juanita and Rayanne in advance for, for everything they're doing and going to do for their children uh, because uh, their representation of the teachers in Indiana tonight uh, was, was phenomenal. I just appreciate both of you. Thank you. I really appreciate hearing that. All right. Well, again, I want to thank all four of you for being here um, and talking and being very honest um, about your views and your thoughts and feelings about this. And, um, you know, I think it was said earlier, you know, we all definitely are all in this together, um, whatever role we're, we're playing in this. Um, so again, just thank you. Um, like I said earlier, we will have more conversations. Um, from WFYI on these topics um, as we go forward. And again, thank you very much and hope everyone has a great night. Thank you.